Hello, welcome to Energy 150, 142, class number 7. This class is going to be about adjusted baseline, but really it's going to be an adjusted baseline aside. We're going to talk about balance point and degree days. And then the next class, basically, we'll start applying that to adjusted baseline. So let's just review a little bit. So why are we uh, talking about balance point and degree days? So remember, when we were looking at adjusted baseline, the first thing we, the first step when we're still at is to choose which model to use. So remember, adjusted baseline is accounting for weather when we're looking at changes in energy uses from year to year. Okay, so the first step in that is choosing what model to use, and that's still in the step we're at actually. So we look, we talked about three different models uh, last class in um, the numbers one, two, and three here. But the four through seven models, we really need to discuss balance point, or sometimes it's called change point temperature. And this is what we're going to discuss this class. Okay, so let's look at first, let's look at the definition of balance point. So this is not just important in this class, but it's important in all um, energy management classes, and it's a really important concept to understand. So we're going to spend a good bit of time on it in this class, and you'll see it again in the future. So let me just read this definition, then we'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. The balance point is the outdoor air temperature causing building heat gains to be dissipated at a rate that creates a desired indoor air temperature. So that's a mouthful. So let's, let's in other words, basically, balance point is the outside air temperature in which the heat gains, so Q dot is heat, is heat, equals the heat losses. And still, that's probably a little confusing, and so we're going to do a couple different examples of it. But... I want to first, let's get a little intuition. Let's think about a car. So this is a um, car, and it's a uh, picture of a sort of a hot car. And we all know that even if the temperature is not um, brutal outside, if it's a really sunny day, the inside of a car can get very hot. So the idea is that the heat gains, the sunlight, um, far outweigh the losses, even on a 70 degree day maybe. But maybe if you desire the car to be 70 degrees inside, that might even occur on a 40 degree day if it's really sunny and not very windy. So the heat gains and heat losses for the car to be 70 degrees occur at an outdoor air temperature maybe of 40 degrees. So you can think of it that the outside air temperature where that creates a desirable inside air temperature is not necessarily the desired in inside air temperature. And that may sound a little confusing, but we'll still go through this a couple more times. So just think about that a little bit more. So let's think about a building, since that's what, what we're looking at in utility bill analysis. And let's think about what the internal loads and what the external loads are. So I already talked about one external load with the car, which was um, sunlight. And there's also wind, so that's an external load, because um, that can heat or cool your building, depending on how strong it is. Um, and there's also conduction through the walls. So those are, um, that's, that's happening too. So that's not an internal or external load, but that's um, how heat is being transferred through here. The internal loads are things like lights, people, computers, projectors, any other equipment that uses electricity is going to produce heat as well. So those are the internal loads. So the temperature at which the internal loads and the external loads balance, so the outside temperature in which they balance, is called the balance point. Okay, so we're going to introduce um, a couple different things here. We're going to look at a, a few internal loads, and the only um, external load we're going to look at to make it simpler, we're not going to look at sunlight or wind, is we're going to look at conduction. So the what conduction says is the heat flow of conduction is due to a temperature difference, which is this, and is proportional to something called UA. So UA, um, so I'm sorry, Q, the, the heat flow of conduction is the heat transfer due to conduction through outside walls, and this unit is in BTUs per hour. UA is the overall heat transfer coefficient for the outside walls. So you can think about it, if you have very, very um, poor insulation, UA is going to be very high. If you have very good insulation, UA is going to be very low. So it's the amount of heat transfer that's going to occur. And then T in and T out are just the inside and outside temperatures. And then, and then this is, and when you subtract them, it's the temperature difference between the inside and outside. So heat's going to flow one way if T in's bigger than T out, and it's going to flow the other direction if T out's bigger than T in. 
So that's the only, um, you know, external load we're going to look at is the conduction. So let's look at just a typical example, and this is sort of a typical classroom. So what I want you to do um, is follow along with me, and we're going to calculate the balance point for both the lights on and lights off in a typical classroom. And we're going to assume the only external load is conduction, and the average U value of the wall is 0 0.5 BTUs per hour per square foot um, per degree Fahrenheit. And then assume the area of the outside wall is 150 square feet. So we, we discussed UA in the last slide. UA is simply this U value, which is how much insulation you have, basically, um, times the area. So we'll look at that in future slides. And then you want to assume the, the room temperature is 70 degrees. And assume each of the light fixtures in the room uses 100 watts, and that there are six light fixtures. And we also want to assume that there are 12 people in the class, and they each put off 400 BTUs per hour. So now that we know all of our assumptions, we're going to do a little bit of math, which is everyone's favorite thing to do. So the first thing we're going to do is do the heat gain calculations. And we're going to do this for the lights on. So first, the people um, we know generate 400 BTUs per hour per person. And there's 12 people. So that's 4,800 BTUs per hour. So that's not too bad. The lights are 100 watts per fixture. We use the unit conversion for BTUs per hour per watt. And we multiply by how many fixtures there are, so we get that number for BTUs per hour for, for light. Now, the gains are just the, since I, I said the only gains in this, um, in this example are the people and the lights, we just add those two numbers together to get a total heat gain of 6,847.2 BTUs per hour. So what we really need to remember when we do the heat losses is that T out um, in our conduction equation is going to be the balance point temperature. Because remember, the definition of balance point is what the outside temperature equals when the heat gains equal the heat losses. So the losses, remember, we're just going to say that's conduction. And remember, conduction was UA times the temperature difference. So UA is our U value, which I gave you here with the units. The area is this. So remember, UA is just the U times the area times the difference in temperatures. So the difference in temperatures, the inside temperature I gave you is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And remember, we don't know the outside temperature. That's what we're looking for. That's the balance point. So that's our heat loss. So we have to, that's the only thing we know right now is that our, that's our losses. So again, we're going to look for when our outside temperature, what, what is the temperature outside? And that's going to give us the balance point when the heat gains equal the heat losses. So in other words, this equation. So we already calculated both of these things. Let's go ahead and sub it into this equation. So this was the total heat gains right here. And this is the total heat losses here. So um, what we do first is we're going to do some rearranging. We're going to have to solve for this balance point temperature. So first, we're just going to multiply this 0.5 times this 150 to give us um, the units 75 BTUs per hour per degree Fahrenheit. Then we're going to distribute that through to both of these temperatures to give us this. Then we're going to subtract both this 5250 from both sides to give us this. And then we're going to um, divide by the 75 to get the balance point temperature. So in this case, the balance point temperature is negative 21 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a little bit weird. So let's, let's do one more example with the lights off. And then we'll talk about the implications of what these balance point temperatures really mean. Okay. So the lights off, the heat gain calculation is going to be the same, except for that basically zero fixtures are going to be on. So we're going to have zero BTUs per hour for the heat gains. So we're just going to have 4,800 BTU, um, BTUs per hour for the heat gains. So we go ahead and do the same exact thing, except on the left-hand side, we start with 4,800 BTUs. So I'm not going to go through all the steps again. But it's the same math, just different numbers. And it turns out we get 6 degrees as our balance point temperature now. Okay, So let's think about what that means. So if we, if we look at the, the two balance points we calculated, is that with the lights on, um, the balance point is negative 21 degrees Fahrenheit. And with the lights off, is 6 degrees Fahrenheit. So it turns out that these are balance points are pretty low, because we did um, this example. There's other, there's going to be other um, heat losses. We didn't, the, the area we used was just an outside wall. There will be heat losses through the ceiling and whatnot, too. 
But let's just think about what these differences in balance points mean. Basically, what that negative 21 degrees Fahrenheit means is that even at 0 degrees or negative 10 degrees, to keep the room at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, you would still have to provide air conditioning. And this is because you have so many people and so many lights on in a small space with only a little bit of um, heat releasing. And you might think, you mean, you may know this from um, a building that if you go into a server room or if you go into another room that has a lot of heat generation, perhaps it's just a computer lab or something with a lot of students in it and no outside walls, that it's very hot compared to other rooms and it might need, it might have air conditioner on even at very cold temperatures in the winter. So what happens when you turn the lights off is you turn off some heat generation. So um, you turn off basically some, some free heating inside that's for, coming from the lights. So um, you end up with a higher temperature at where you'd have to um, go from heating to cooling. So we talked a little bit about how um, balance point temperature is called change point temperature as well. So what that means is that basically it's the temperature where your building changes from heating to cooling. So that's another way to think about it is that um, these two temperatures are the, the when you would have to change from heating to cooling to keep that um, 70 degree indoor temperature. So I'll leave it up to you as a, as a, and you'll have this on your homework is that what is the balance point temperature when there are no internal heat gains? So what if there's no people or no lights or no other internal heat gains? You'll have to um, think about that. So it's, we're going to leave balance point just for a second here to talk about um, heating degree days and cooling degree days. But we'll come back to balance point very quickly and why it's important um, when you're doing heating degree days and cooling degree days. But first we need to define these two things. So heating degree days and cooling degree days. Wikipedia has a definition. I put it up here. Um, but basically, the, I like the first sentence. Heating degree days are is a heating degree day is a measurement designed to reflect the demand for energy needed to heat a building. So the idea is that you calculate this number called heating degree days. The higher it is, the more energy you're going to need to heat the building. So cooling degree days reflects the amount of energy used to cool a home or business. So again, the same principle applies. The higher the cooling degree days, the higher amount of energy you'll need to cool the building. Okay, so you can see right away that this is going to be affected by climate and um, other factors. So I'm going to show you just sort of to get a feel for heating degree days and cooling degree days, I'm going to show you um, Wolfram Alpha and how Wolfram Alpha can calculate this. So let me go ahead and bring that up over here. And if we just type in degree days, it's going to bring up a sort of a, a nice little um, thing we can do here. So what we can see is that we have from start date to end date, so this is um, you know December to January, so just this past month, and we're looking at cooling and heating um, degree days. So what happens is is that um, you know we can go ahead and run this again. So it's still computing, but what happens is this is the base temperature. And these are the degree days. Here's the temperature history. And we can see right now for the past month, there was 1,080. And how you uh, uh, do this is days degree Fahrenheit difference in the past month. So if we look, um, you know, sort of that's just the past month. What if we do the past year? So let's just go. So January 2013 to January 2014. So if we look at that, now we have cooling degree days too because we're in the summer. So it turns out, you may not realize this, but we use a lot more energy in Wilmington for heating than cooling because we have a lot more heating degree days than cooling degree days. And we'll see um, a little bit about how that, that goes on. But let's think about this. Let's look at the, this base temperature. So what this base temperature, all this base temperature means is that's the change point temperature. That's the balance point we were talking about. Remember how I said we we're going to come back to that? So let's say we put in a very low heating and cooling base temperature. And that's what you really should do. You should do the, the base to be the same for each of them. 
So let's say we put in 10 degrees Fahrenheit for both of these. Let's see what happens. So what that's saying is, is that when I, it gets to be 10 degrees outside, that's when I change from heating to cooling. Because we have maybe it's a, um, a room with a lot of internal heat gain, so we don't need um, heating that much. So let's go ahead and, and run this and see what happens. So what happens is, is our heating goes way down and our cooling goes way up. So this is a really, really important concept in energy management because what usually happens is, especially in commercial buildings, is that your cooling um, energy usage is way higher than your heating energy usage. And that's because you have so many people and things in a building with not as many outdoor walls. And again, this is going to be dependent on what, what kind of building you're in, but that's the basic idea. Okay, so we have, we've have had Wolfram Alpha calculate this stuff for us, but what we're going to do now is I'm going to show you how to calculate it um, yourself, so these heating and cooling degree days. So now that we got an idea for how Wolfram Alpha sort of calculates heating degree days and how it can sort of be a helpful tool to, to see what's going on, let's look at how we do it ourselves. So here is... Uh, the how you do the calculation of heating degree days and cooling degree days. So remember, heating degree days and cooling degree days use the same base. So we saw in Wolfram Alpha, when we just typed it in, a value of 65 degrees for the base came up. However, it's much more accurate to use the balance point temperature. And we'll even go over um, how to figure out a good value for balance point temperature for the schools when you do your adjusted baseline. A big note is you should never have negative values of heating degree days or cooling degree days. So if you do, just make that zero. So never have negative values. If you do the calculation you get a negative value, make that value zero. So in, in our formulas below, T hourly is the average outside temperature for a given hour. This formula is going to change if temperature is not given hourly. So we'll go over how that, how that changes. So let's look at this. For a single hour, um, the heating degree days are the T base minus the T hourly divided by 24. And the cooling degree days are, are much the same. It's T hourly minus the T base divided by 24. Now these are just for a single hour. So what you do is you get the, the and this is what Wolfram Alpha does in all the calculations, to get the total heating degree days or cooling degree days of a total time period, let's say you're looking for a month. Well, you'd have to add up all the, one, all the single hours for that whole month. So you do this for the, all, every single hour and then add them up to get the total number of heating degree days and cooling degree days. So that's the idea for the single hours. So let's look at some sample calculations. So what's the heating degree days and cooling degree days for the following cases? So a base of 65 degrees and 55 degrees outside um, over one hour. If we have a base of 65 and it's 55 degrees outside for over two hours, and if we have a base of 55 degrees, and it's 55 degrees outside over two hours. And if our base is 45 degrees, and it's 55 degrees outside over three hours. So let's think about um, how to do these. And if you want to try to practice, you can pause the video here and, and try to do this yourself with the formulas. But I'm going to go over the answers right away. So let's look at this. With a base of 65 and 55 degrees, remember, heating degree days is the base minus the, minus the outside temperature over 24. So that's 65 minus 55 divided by 24. So 65 minus 55 is 10, 10 over 24. So um, the main difference with this one is over two hours, so you just have to add the first hourly one plus the second hourly one. Now cooling degree days are zero in both of these cases because when you do the calculation for cooling degree days, you get negative 10 over 24. And remember when I said there's no such thing as negative cooling degree days or heating degree days. So we just make that zero, okay? So if the base and the outside temperature are the same, the cooling degree days and the heating degree days are zero. So again, sort of think about it like this in terms of balance point temperature. If the base is the balance point temperature, that's the point where you change over from heating and cooling, or you need no heating or cooling. So it makes sense that the heating degree days and cooling degree days would be zero when the base and the outside temperature are the same. Even though the inside temperature may be 70 degrees, that's... Um, Still, you don't need any heating or cooling. So it switches over if the base is 45 degrees and it's 55 degrees outside. So what this is saying is, again, sort of, sort of like the, remember, the base is sort of like the balance point temperature. So 
if it's 45 degrees inside, or I'm sorry, if it's 45 degrees is your base, that means you're still in cooling. So it makes sense that the heating degree days are zero and the cooling degree days are just the outside temperature minus the base and then you add it up three times over three hours. Okay, so that's that's sort of a, a sample of how to do that. So those are just for hourly um, temperatures. So what we're going to do now is if we have more general, if we don't have hourly uh, temperatures, maybe or maybe we have sub-hourly or um, daily or something, some different time of temperature values. So again, the main one of the main points is heating degree days and cooling degrees use the same base, and a typical value is 65 degrees, but it's much more accurate to use the balance point temperature. Okay, so we always want to use the balance point temperature as our base temperature if we can ever avoid it. And the other big note is you should never have negative values of heating degree days or cooling degree days. Okay. So the difference here is that instead of T hourly, you have T average, which is the average outside temperature for an, an amount of time. It can be any amount of time, really. And T is the time in hours which T average occurs. So that see this little T? So that's what we added to our equation. So it's the same thing that once you get this for a single time, single, um, time period or single temperature period, to get the total heating degree days or cooling degree days, you just sum all of these single calculations. So we're going to look at uh, some examples in Excel. Uh, but first, I want to sort of show you how, how we could set it up in Excel. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use Excel to calculate the heating and degree days and cooling degree days for several things. So here's uh, one example, and you can see these are hourly temperatures because the hours of the day here. Okay, and these would be the average outside temperature here. And we're going to need if or sum if formulas to do this, and I'll sort of go over what those are and how to use them. So that's one example with the hourly that we'll go over in Excel. And the other one, now you can see that it's not hourly anymore, that there's all different sort of time periods. So we'll go over how to figure that out as well. So again, we're still going to need some um, some if and if formulas, so I'll go over that. So if and some if should be a review from your Excel class, but I'll go over it briefly. The if statements in Excel, I'm going to have you go to a video that one of my students made um, in the past about an if statements in Excel. It doesn't have to do with heating degree days and cooling degree days, but it will show you sort of how if statements work. So you can think about with heating degree days and cooling degree days that if you do the calculation, and if you get a negative number, here I said if, if you get a negative number, it should be zero. So that's where you're going to have to use the if statements. Okay? So go ahead and watch this YouTube video if you need some help, and I'll put a link to it. Um, the link to it's here, and I'll try to put a link to it on this video as well. So some ifs I'm going to go over a little bit more in depth since they're a little bit harder. So some ifs make it so you can sum a group of numbers in a range if a certain criteria is met. Okay? So what that means is that um, in the figure to the right, we can see a, a sort of an example. Maybe we have to know how many items did Bill sell from the beginning date to the end date. So we can see there's date, personnel, and number of items sold. So we can see that you know we this is sort of a complex problem. We need to take into account the date. We also need to take into account the personnel who who sold it. So let's look at what's going on here. So how we do this is that some ifs uses the form some range, and then we have a bunch of different criteria. So criteria range, criteria one, and we can keep going on with that. So we can have as many criteria ranges and criteria as we would like. And some range is the numbers that will be summed. So I'm going to go over an example if, if you're not following this. And criteria range is the location of the numbers to which a criteria will be applied. And again, it sounds sort of weird, but we'll see this in an example. And criteria is the criteria which criteria range will be applied. Whew, so that's a mouthful. But let's, it's going to help out when we do this little simple example with a bill and the number of items sold. So let's think about it like this. The first thing we're looking at here, the C6 through C13, is the sum range. So what that means is if we look down what C6 and C13 are, is that's actually the numbers that we are going to sum if the criteria is met. Okay. So then the A6 through A13, the, this is our first criteria range. 
So it's the location of numbers that we're going to apply a criteria to. Okay? So the criteria to that we're going to apply here, the A6 through A13 is the criteria range. We're going to do something to the dates. So that's what we're looking at here. So what we're going to do to these dates is, first off, these dates have to be greater than or equal to, and this is sort of the how we draw this up, so we put it in quotation marks, the greater than or equal to, ampersand B1. So all that's saying is it's got to be greater than or equal to the beginning date. And the, our next criteria range is A6 through A13, so that's the same thing, the dates. And that has to be less than or equal to B2. So what this is doing right now is it's just looking at just the dates that went from 11.9 to 11.11. 11. So that's what's going on there. So what we'd have to do is if we wanted to add Bill in here, we'd have to do another criteria range of this row being equal to Bill. So that's the um, so that's what we'd have to add in here to to um, to make it equal to just the ones that Bill sold. So you can see how some ifs is a very good formula. So what I'm going to do now is sort of a, a big Excel tutorial with calculating heating degree days and cooling degree days with a list of data. So you'll see that in uh, the, the next video.